suited for commercial cockpits at all. Tracking the sound barrier in level flight will be more than a spectacular feat. It will also give the Air Force valuable knowledge of the resources of new propulsive systems. Captain Yeager gets aboard the XS-1. It can't be a long flight he's going to have in the little aircraft. At full power, the flight can't last more than two and a half minutes. But it's going to be a fast one. In 1947, Chuck Yeager became a model hero for military pilots when he became the first man to break through the sound barrier in his experimental rocket plane, the X-1. big moment. Through the sound barrier, the first time ever in level flight. His relaxed, laconic style while in great peril became dubbed the right stuff. Faster than the speed of sound. The right stuff as, as we see it in test pilots and in, uh, in, in the early but not the present astronauts is really this combination of high technical competence, a very rugged individualism and a very high level of competitiveness. The latter two are very destructive when you're trying to function as an effective team. The trouble is, whole generations of military flyers who venerated those test pilots and tried to emulate them went on to fly for commercial airlines, taking the right stuff with them. In many accidents, the result is not that the crew makes a major mistake, but that the captain decides in an emergency situation that he must fly the aircraft and he must physically take control of the airplane because he has the right stuff. What he fails to do then is to manage the situation and to use the resources that are available from the other crew members. So he has turned it into a single seat fighter when in fact he needs all of the assistance he can get. He refuses to, uh, to see it as a group problem but as an individual problem. The co-pilot writes, I was the first officer on an airline flight into Chicago O'Hare. The captain was flying and we were on approach to runway four right, getting radar vectors and moving along at 250 knots. On our approach, approach control told, told us to slow down to 180. I acknowledged and waited for the captain to slow down. He did nothing, so I figured he didn't hear the clearance. So I repeated, approach said slow to 180. And his reply was something to the effect of, I'll do what I want. I told him at least twice more and received the same kind of answer. Approach control asked why we had not slowed yet. And uh, I told him we were doing the best we could and their reply was, you almost hit another aircraft. They then asked us to turn east. I told them we'd rather not because of the weather and various other things and we were given present heading and to maintain 3,000 feet. The captain descended to 3,000 feet and kept going to 2,500 feet even though I told him our altitude was, was 3,000. His comment was, you just look out the damn window. I think it's, it's a real potential problem because the factors that would lead you to a, an effective, smooth working crew are, are very different from those that make you a, a fighter ace. The right stuff is in fact the wrong stuff. On a bitterly cold day in January 1982, Air Florida's Palm 90 flight to Miami from Washington, D.C. ended up here in the frozen Potomac River. Only five survived. Somewhere under here lay what remained of a Boeing 737 jet. Simply because for every macho pilot flying today, it turns out there's his equal and opposite number, the non-assertive co-pilot. This amateur photograph shows Palm 90 before it left the airport gate. There's a dangerous buildup of snow and ice on the leading edge of the wing. It will inhibit lift on takeoff. The foundation for the accident had already been laid. Then they taxied out onto the runway. What happened was that after they had completed all of the pre-takeoff items on the checklist, the next step was to set takeoff thrust, and they do that by advancing the power levers allowing the engines to accelerate and stabilize. They look good and then go ahead and smoothly push on up until we're getting takeoff power indications in the EPR gauges. The engine pressure ratio gauge is a direct measurement of the engine thrust. But that day the probes to the engine had iced up, giving an artificially high reading. Now at this point the first officer is obviously uncomfortable about something. He makes references to boy it's cold, all that doesn't look right, it sure doesn't look right, does it? 
Uh, what he's talking about, in all probability, is the fact that although we have takeoff power indicated in the EPER indicators, in fact, if you look at the other indications of power output, they are considerably lower than what uh, should have been seen in that circumstance. Now, because we're in a 727 and we have a third engine, we can show you uh, what that should have looked like by pushing the number three engine on up to take off thrust. And in this case, it is a correct uh, EPER indication. The gauge on the right is accurately showing the thrust the third engine is producing. And look how much higher the needles on the other corresponding instruments are reading. It was this critical visual disparity that the co-pilot had sensed. For whatever reasons, the first officer was unable to convince the captain that there was something wrong. They continued the takeoff roll with significantly less than takeoff thrust set, and that's what led to the accident. In fact, he wasn't assertive enough to jolt the captain into realizing the danger and aborting the takeoff. This lack of confidence is so great, it's as if co-pilots would rather die than stick their necks out. Several years ago, there was a study done at uh, a major air carrier where um, you know, pilots or the captains uh, in these particular simulator runs were asked to pretend that they were incapacitated and they did it very subtly they didn't slump over and scream and say that you know uh, act like they were dying essentially but they sort of slumped over at the controls in that simulator in that simulator study approximately 25 percent of the aircraft hit the ground because for some reason the co-pilots didn't take control that check is done down to the uh Airspeed bugs. We can witness the fatal combination of the macho type and the non-assertive type in this training film. It's a reconstruction in a simulator using voice transcripts from a serious accident that actually happened to a major airline. Here comes flight slope. Watch out for the way the flight engineer in the seat nearest us and the captain, John, on the left, gang up on the young co-pilot in the front right. They're just about to begin their final descent. Maybe gate 17, John. Oh, good. That's right, by that little snack bar. Yeah, yeah. good gate. Yeah, good well, gate. we've got about a half hour on the ground. We can uh, run in there, get something to eat, get the weather, and be on our way to Seattle. Good. Well, the glide slope there, John. Yeah, well, we know where we are out here. We're all right. Are you waiting? The fox is going to have it wired. I hope so. Right in. Oh, yeah. No problem. A little faster than you normally fly this, John? Oh, yeah, but it's nice and smooth. We're going to get in right on time, maybe a little bit ahead of time. We got it made. Sure hope so. You know, John, you know the difference between a, a duck and a co-pilot? What is the difference? Well, a duck can fly. Well said. Seems like there's a little bit of a tailwind up here, John. Yeah, we're saving gas. Help us get in a couple minutes early, too. In fact, they're less than eight miles out, going 40 knots too fast and 200 feet too low. John, you're just a little bit below the MDA here. Yeah, well, we'll take care of it here. The captain's answer to being too low is to casually leapfrog the aircraft up over the glide slope in a last-minute attempt to correct. It's a fatal maneuver. Just a little bit high. Well, gear down. Final check. <clears throat> no smoking signs. It's on. Flight and nav instruments. There, toss checked. Two degrees. Our landing gear. It's down three green. Speed brakes. Really look awful high, John. Uh, Speed five brakes. degrees. Five degrees. Fifteen degrees. Twenty-five. Like, John, five. you're really high. Five you're going to need flat. 40 is what you need here. Get the speed brakes in. Get this thing down. They're, uh, they're armed. You want the speed brakes on? I don't think you're going to make it, John, if you don't get this sucker on the ground. Get it on, John. You're not going to make there it. Go. You're not going to make it. Oh, we're going around. Oh, damn, 140, 139. It's like I stopped, John. Not gonna make it, John. Great, John, I told you. Jeez. Oh. 
The United Airlines DC-8 that crashed at Portland six years ago did so because of a combination of all those factors. The captain was blamed for not being decisive enough about getting the plane down onto the ground. Long after they'd been advised there was nothing more they could do to resolve the landing gear issue, they continued to pick away at the problem. It was the flight engineer's job to monitor the rate at which the plane was gobbling up fuel and get that information across to the captain. But he never adequately rammed it home, and the captain was left in a world of his own thinking he had far more fuel than he actually did. Worse still, while the co-pilot was circling about, the flight engineer was allowed to spend ages preparing the cabin for an emergency landing. He even left his station for an extended tour of the passenger cabin. The aircraft was actually flying away from the airport when the first of its four engines flamed out. The captain never knew what hit him. In an attempt to make sure accidents like this never happen again, United Airlines have turned themselves into world leaders by rethinking their approach to pilot training. This was basically a man management problem, so they've turned to the world of business management for their answer. John, we've been discussing this afternoon elements in our cockpit resource management program, which we call CRM. In the elements of the they use a number of charts which depict a wide range of personality types between the two extremes of concern solely for the job and concern solely for getting along with people. The grid styles under which our program is designed. Mike, EC and Chuck are all United Pilots. They're being taught to recognize the personalities of their colleagues by reference to the charts. I saw the other scale then, which is the 9-1 position here with a description of the efficiency of the operation is a result of controlling conditions so that the human element interferes to a minimum degree. The definition of that to you would be what then? That would be a pilot that would be a, a one-man band you know, that just really doesn't want to take the rest of his crew into consideration. How would he react to criticism? I think he would try to cut it off. You mean to win his position? Win his position. It's got to be his way and wouldn't want to discuss it in <clears throat> anything other than the way he saw the situation. Do you think any aircraft accidents have happened because of this? Oh, absolutely. I can think of several where uh, uh, two-thirds of the crew in a three-man cockpit were left out of the decision-making process. Specifically, um, uh, say an airplane that ran out of fuel when one of the crew members was warning the captain at the time that they weren't going to make the destination with the fuel they had on board. There are, there are numerous incidents where you can think of you know, one person in the cockpit overriding everyone else. And and let's move up to this 9-9 position. How do we define that in your terms? Well, in, in my terms and my experiences, that's a man who, uh, who you know where he's coming from all the time. He advocates his position. He also knows where you're coming from all the time because he inquires to the rest of the crew. He, he inquires from them uh, the elements needed to make a decision. Uh, he's concerned with accomplishing the task to a very high degree but he's to an equally high degree concerned with the input of his crew and taking into consideration everything that he has available in making that decision. He's not the type of individual that makes a decision by himself, that thinks he has all the answers. Uh, he, he follows through on conflict resolution, and then after he has everything available to him, he can make a decision. Let me ask you a leading question then. Do you know many people like this? <laughs> not as many as I would like to. But uh, there are more and more around. There really are. <laughs>